Hey, fam. I thought we were going to do it at the same time. Oh, I was just wow, guys, we are recording together today. <laughs> Tessa. Fake <Hang> out. <laughs> Tessa. She didn't join me. So <laughs> let's try it again. Ready? Okay. Hey, hey fam, fam. <laughs> We nailed that one. We nailed that one. Now, welcome back to another amazing episode of the FemRegard podcast with Carolina and Tessa. I introduced myself. That's really cute. Love that. Um, (laughs) We just had an amazing recording session with the gentleman from Atomic City. Yes, the Lewis brothers, two of the three of the Lewis brothers. We had Taylor and Burke on today. Um, They have their own production company that does so much cool stuff. Um, They do a lot of commercial projects, but they also do their own like passion projects, narrative projects. Mm -hmm. So they're they're capable of a lot. (laughs) Yeah, like. You know, they've just casually worked with Amazon and DJI and like Microsoft, Microsoft, so many big, just like big clients. But what you're going to hear from this episode is what it took for them to get there. And even though it was like seemingly a really fast, but also long journey, I think you get to hear all the different steps as and how it could be possible for someone like yourselves to to branch off and get commercial work done. Um, It's a really great resource to make income while you're working on your passion projects and that's why we wanted to bring the brothers on today Mm -hmm. um just because i think it's a you'll hear it you'll hear it from them the pros and cons of everything Mm because there always is but i think there's a lot of pros and and it just makes you so much better, I think, as a professional, as someone wonderful to work with. <laughs> yeah. Like these little things where it just goes such a long way to where you can really build your network and your business. Yeah. And make sure you listen to the end because they have a little freebie for you. Oh, and I'm not yeah. going to tell you what it is now because you have to listen for it. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I think this is going to be really great for anyone who is interested in building out their business or branching off into commercial work mm-hmm. and and just being an amazing professional in this industry. So It will get you far. Get your notebooks out and take some notes and enjoy. Just the level of organization and communication. No wonder why you guys are doing so well in the industry. Um, it was Thank really you. impressive. Probably first to first for us to, yeah. to see that yeah. level of professionalism come through our inboxes. So Because it's something like we struggle with with other production companies and other professionals. Is like, you know, we know we're still green like we're still relatively Mm. novices you know but we from the very start have been super professional like i i'm a virgo i just like to be organized all the time anyway (laughs) but like you know we just we always try to be on top of like returning emails and doing all that kind of stuff and we don't really see it that much in return so it's really Mm. refreshing when we do see someone that's like oh hey i i wrote this list of questions you could ask us you know stuff like that (laughs) like it's it's really it's awesome so we appreciate that thank you guys (laughs) Yeah. yeah. I don't th- I don't think I've ever met people that respond so fast to emails. <laughs> like anywhere in the like who we've ever worked with, like you guys, I'll send you an email within like an hour later, you get a response, which is just wild. Honestly, it's just, just because I have OCD and I hate seeing notifications <laughs> on my phone and my email's connected. So as soon as I see I have an un- unopened email, I'm like, Caroline, I'm gonna respond. Yeah. <laughs> like- she's like I I actually was responding with you this time, but it's honestly like the habit too that Tessa normally. That's why I was like, let's let's CC her in it because <laughs> she will just get right on it. Um, and I think that's something that I think why we've also landed such amazing guests is is because we've always been really professional, and I think that carries probably over to the success of your business and why you're able to work with top companies that we're excited to also like hear about. But yeah, it's I think that goes a long way. I think if you're trying to break in the industry, it's like small things like that that make you stand out. And um, yeah, so just you guys are great <laughs> in that regard. I agree because like you can attest to this, but like so often <clears throat> in this industry, you're, you're dealing with creatives and people who are just like trying to be creative in their whole lives, but they're not as good at doing like managerial stuff or mm-hmm. like business 
of things. And so to like, I really appreciate people who are concise and to the point and like have a very detailed, you know, action items that you can do like that just definitely helps uh, move things along, especially when you're doing projects and films and commercials are, are very chaotic sometimes. Yeah. So to have just a little bit of sanity in there where it's just like, Hey, here are clear action items that just makes the process go a lot smoother. So yeah, that's definitely something that, that I appreciate in this business. Yeah. It makes sense because, you know, a lot of times creative minds can be chaotic, you know, like you've got so many ideas floating around at the same time and to get business done, <laughs> like somebody has got to be the organized brain, you know? So yeah, sure. if, if your company and your people, core people that you work with have that worked out, like that's the dream, you uh, know? Yeah, for sure. It's the secret sauce. Yeah. <laughs> so guys... Taylor and Burke Lewis, why don't you guys tell us about yourselves a little bit, introduce um, your backgrounds and how you formed your production company? Well, how we started, like, I don't know what you know from us from looking at our website, but me and Burke and our other person we work with, we're all brothers. We grew up together in a little small little town in northern Utah making little tiny films in our backyard. Mainly, we just blew things up with gasoline and <laughs> made our mom super worried all the time. Nice. Um, I think we went to the hospital only a couple times. But... We, had the, we had the cops call on us plenty of times. So. <laughs> that is definitely true. Oh, man. I mean, the most exciting things that happen up in northern Utah, you know? Yeah. <laughs> My brother's yeah. in Logan right now, so that's, oh, no, that's right. why I can say yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> that's basically where we're from is Logan. So shout out. Um, yeah. yeah, it's just there's nothing to do up there. So we were so bored. We just like, well, let's what can we do? So we lit things on fire, capture it on video and slow it down and show it to our friends later. So that's really how we got our start. And that's perfect. It prepped you for all kinds of special effects. Like <laughs> if YouTube was around back when we were starting our filmmaking career, we probably would be YouTube influencers mm -hmm. by now just because of all the you know, the things that we did. I mean, Burke once jumped off like a 18 foot shed into just some cardboard boxes. He says, like we got that. He shot. says once we must've done that a dozen times <laughs> in one day. And no one got hurt except the next day Burke at school broke his arm. But, oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that's but then, hilarious. That's, and then like, so we did that growing up, but then like in high school, we thought we could start making money doing this. Like we would start approaching like, you know, the cheerleaders to do like a, like an end of year slideshow or like the football team, we started doing, you know, Smart. kind of boring things to just kind of understand how it works on like a more professional level. And just, uh, you know, we didn't have jobs in high school. So we kind of just used um, the, the videos that we would do for different organizations in the school mm -hmm. as a way to make just money enough to just, mm -hmm. you know, through our teenage years. And then it was uh, sometime in our you know early twenties we decided like take it more serious and that's when we started approaching bigger companies and getting bigger gigs and um, you know just kind of went from there and just slowly built ourselves up to where we are now. So that's kind of us in a nutshell, I guess. Yeah, I have a question. Okay. In that time, were you all like doing the same kind of roles, like taking turns, or were there already strong like? impulses to I'm going to be the cameraman like that's like you know Burke you're like this is me uh, or, or you know like I'm taking care of editing like the stuff or were you all equally like trying it all out uh, it's kind of interesting you ask that because we get that question a lot because there's there's three of us brothers and we all kind of share a lot of similar roles mm -hmm. and the way we split up back then and I think back then it was more subconscious whereas like now it's more deliberate um we try to have one person spearhead a project and so generally they'll direct a project and be the final say with that project yeah and then the rest of us will kind of just fill in where we can and depending on the project especially back then you know we're doing every role you know we're acting in it we're shooting it we're doing the editing and so uh, the person who kind of spearheads it and it was their idea they'll like call the shots as far as you know directing it and shooting it and they'll have the final say, but then we all kind of share roles and we can kind of be, you know, we can transplant each other depending on where we go. Our, our brother Rhett is actually usually the one that acts or acted in those pieces. <laughs> so, so we can say he, without question, was lit on fire more than Tay and I were. <laughs> just, he's the one getting fireballs yeah, no, thrown at him. No offense to Berg, but he's not. Oh, come on, Tay. <laughs> 
we've had him do a couple like in our early years we entered like this um film like commercial contest and burke acted in it and those commercials didn't always do super well uh, what, what's funny is there was uh some of the judges one year uh they were we met him after and they're like who was that like you were in one of those spots and they're like never do that again I'm like, okay <laughs> fine <laughs> So I can appreciate constructive criticism, um, but they could have said it in a nicer way. Yeah. <laughs> but I think that's such a great model, though, because it's like you guys can basically you can all do everything. But there's certain, you know, um, departments that each of you stand out in. And I mean, even with just Carolina and I, like, it's the same kind of way for a lot of things, you know, like like video editing. We can both do. We've learned it together, but Carolina has excelled in it and actually enjoys it. So she does most of the video <laughs> editing and then I stick to the audio editing. So, you know, it's nice to like, but, you know, if she's out of town and something needs done, I can do it. So it's mm-hmm. nice to have that balance, you know, and it, I think it's also great that you guys like choose, you know, this person is going to spearhead this project. Because again, it's like for us, if one of us is busy, if one of us is going out of town, like we still got to get our shit done, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's great to have that, that it sounds like it's a really good balance that the three of you have. Yeah, it definitely is. And we, like you said, we do have our own like specialties that we all like do well in. Like Burke, by far and large, knows so much about gear, like all those technical things, like what a specific sensor does on a camera or like why is this camera a little bit better with its color science and stuff like that like Burke knows that stuff like to a T and then like Rhett is a like his skill level is like a people Mm -hmm. person that kid can walk into a room and like everyone is (laughs) is his friend instantly I don't know how he does it but he just does it and then like me I'm kind of like that like mix of both like I understand the gear I'm a pretty good people person not to say Burke isn't I'm not saying he isn't <laughs> Burke just getting all the shit but this morning this is a good therapy <laughs> session for me today <laughs> hey he know he's really smart with gear that's pretty good no we good. need okay. we need a Burke yeah <laughs> so <laughs> listeners I'll just see myself out this can just be a tape podcast <laughs> No, we need that. And that's so, I think it's always important to know what your strengths are and what your weaknesses are. Um, So you can let someone be a leader in that moment, you know, like you're perfect. Like we, like without even having to speak about it, like we know which person is going to do better in like a a situation. Like, yeah, you didn't handle that. Like, okay, Tessa, like queen of emails, I'm queen of phone calls. So, you know, like- I hate being on the phone. Like that's a perfect balance. (laughs) So it's like those kind of things. It's just so great to like work out, especially when you're working together. Mm -hmm. Um, So what for our listeners, can you- um, say that Atomic City really does because it's not like narrative films. It's commercial work and like video work for big corporations and companies, right? Or you can spear yes. that. You can say that better. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're good. So our specialty, um, like what we do, we do a lot of, we do commercial work mostly. Um, and so we've done, oh, sorry, um, we've done work for like Amazon, Microsoft, uh, DJI. We've done some work for Disney here and there. And so like we really specialize in just doing product videos and things like mm-hmm. that um, for different companies. And that's what we yeah, do. Yeah. And to, to add to that, like we do, we have the corporate, the commercial side of things. And that really just is a great way of paying the bills. Um, we also do passion projects on top of that. So um, we've done our own feature films, uh, micro micro budget films, um, and we also are hired guns for other people's features. So we might do the editing on people's features. We'll help shoot some. We'll do B camera on some. So we kind of do all of that. As far as just things that are done under the umbrella of Atomic City, a lot of it, yeah, like on our website, is mostly just uh, commercial work because you know that just it's an easy way to pay the bills instead of you oh, know yeah. trying yeah. to negotiate an indie film to give us the money that we think we deserve, you know, it's easier to get that on the corporate side of things. Yeah. So how exactly, I mean, you guys spoke about how you started out yourselves, like how you got the experience, how you kind of, you know, put it all together. But for other people who have also been, you know, making films for a long time and kind of have the drive that you guys do, how do you recommend really starting the business? Like, how did you find these clients? How did you get a hold of them? How did you get them to look at you and and all of that? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good question. Cause like it took a long time. I think before we started getting like good money, like to make a living really off of what we did, it took like 10 years. It took a long time to kind of get that ball rolling to get like really good clients in. 
And really what it come, came down to us is just like um, reaching out to like family and friends or people like our friends know and contacting those businesses and saying, hey, let us do a video for you for cheap or either for free. And then once we did that, our goal was to like knock that video out of the park, make it really good. And so much so that they will want to hire mm -hmm. us again. And that's kind of just how we took it. Like we really worked hard, made a good product. They loved it. They hired us again. Yeah. And so like if you trace back kind of our success, you can really trace it back to a single uh, project that finally was for a company that had a budget that they could pay. And it was one of those things where we approached the owner and we're like, hey, I, I know we don't have a lot of experience doing this. We would love to do a project for you. Um, would you allow it to do us? We'll give you or allow us to do it. We'll give you a good rate. And then, yeah, he he gave us that project and we did a great job, or at least we feel like we, we did something that we were proud of um, and the company liked it. And then that company um, had a network of their um, business associates. And so then they kind of recommended us to their uh, friends, uh, business owner friends. And so then we did projects for all of them. Um, and that kind of just kept going until again, where we are today, it's like, um, one project led to the next and then led to the next. And then we meet a different network, a group of people. And then, you know, that might kind of get, it might exhaust every, uh, prospect there. And then we'll kind of do that to a different friend. We'll reach out to them. We'll, we'll see that they're either a business owner or maybe they're, um, you know, working on a campaign that we really like. Um, so, and so speaking of Amazon, the way that kind of started <clears throat> is we had a friend actually before they were friends, um, there were these local filmmakers that we really wanted to get to know. Um, and so we actually, uh, entered a, a commercial making contest to, and really it was just because we knew they were going to be judges on it. And so we entered this contest just so we could eventually meet them as judges. And we ended up winning the contest and meeting those judges. And uh, we just, you know, kind of geeked out for a minute. We're like, we love you guys. We love what you've done. We'd love to, you know, go out to lunch with you. And so we went out to lunch with them and then became friends that way. And then it was honestly years later where those same friends were producing um, commercials for like a, a worldwide campaign. And so what we ended up doing is um, we saw the campaign that was currently airing and we decided to make a video that was similar to what the campaign was just as like almost a spec piece. Mm -hmm. um, Cause then we met with our friend and we're like, Hey, you know, we made this, it's similar to what you're doing for that campaign. Um, is there any chance you could give us a shot and do, you know, one or two of those commercials. Mm -hmm. And so they gave us just two commercials, um, just as like a trial run. And they were, you know, they paid dirt at the time because we were, we didn't have any experience in that specific, uh, field. Yeah. But then from there we, uh, you know, we did, you know, a hundred different, uh, spots for them. They flew us all over the world shooting different commercials. Can you then, real quick, sorry to interrupt, no? but for an, for our listeners, um, <laughs> what is a spec commercial? No, oh, smart. So a spec spot for us, or is just, uh, we did a, a commercial, basically we paid out of pocket to pay for that spot. And, and I guess this one wasn't a true spec commercial because a spec commercial would be something where, um, you make a commercial for the company that you want to make the commercial for, and then you can potentially even sell that commercial to that company. Um, in this case, it wasn't exactly that it was more it was kind of spec in that it just mimicked the style that they were going for. It wasn't a commercial that they could actually use. It was kind of just like, oh, here's what we're capable of right? <clears throat> um, to kind of show off our skills. No, very smart. Yeah, that it was more like a probably like a demo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess you would say. Okay. Yeah, but but spec in the way that, you know, we paid out of pocket for it. You know, we hired the actor and things to be in it. Um, but so anyway, so that <clears throat> excuse me, that campaign went on. You know, we, we worked for that campaign for years. <clears throat> Jeez, my throat. I'm sorry. Um, and then ultimately, um, Amazon, uh, department of Amazon was looking for uh, a certain style of commercial. So they saw that campaign uh -huh. and they reached out to the ad agency that had hired us to, to help with that campaign. And they're like, we love these spots that, that, uh, this agency is doing, um, who was your video team. And so then that agency told them that it was us. And so then the Amazon reached out to us to make a similar spot for Amazon, which led there. Oh and then, gosh. uh, Amazon is interesting because Amazon, they're kind of <laughs> each department is kind of like their own little startup company. So we, we did those spots for like one part of Amazon and then other departments saw that spot 
and thought, hey, we want to do something similar to that. And so then <laughs> those departments reached out to the other department and asked who did that. And then that led to us. And then we did it for them. And then this is actually kind of a cool story. Um, we did a, we finally got to the Amazon Kindle team, which is the biggest uh, department in Amazon. Hmm, um, we that. did, <laughs> we did a spot for them. Um, and Jeff Bezos actually saw it and he emailed us and said it was his favorite spot that Amazon has ever produced, Wow, which is, which is a pretty big accomplishment. Yeah. Was Guys, and then so and I've been cool. talking, I've been talking for a minute, so I'll wrap it up here in a second. But then that led to doing a spot for the Amazon echo before that was ever launched. And so we did the launch video for that. And it was actually an interesting thing because, um, when the, the Kindle, the, Department was trying to find a production team for that spot. Um, Jeff Bezos was like, hey, reach out to my guys that did that other spot and have mm -hmm. them do this. So that's a pretty, wow. it was pretty remarkable to us. Like, I can't believe like this, you know, billionaire guy, founder of Amazon is like requesting us specifically. So <laughs> that was, I mean, it's just a, a great opportunity and just the, the, pieces that aligned to get to that point it was just like we still pinch ourselves when that happens like i can't believe like you know we were being requested specifically. it was a cool experience so, yeah. anyway that's kind of a long story but that's kind no, of like how, it's a great how there. story to show the progression of like again what a spec is so and like the investment and mm -hmm. then the return on yeah. investment later on because you don't if you do such a good job it's something like that where yes you have to like i think as as poor independent creators, <laughs> it can feel like, oh man, I'm always giving my work for free. I'm mm -hmm. always like, you know, but if you have a strategy behind it, which is kind of like, you can see the bigger picture of you no, know, like, okay, I'm investing some, you know, I have to hire some actors. I have to like put together this kind of project, this spec project. It could really, you know, turn into getting the full funding for something even larger, yeah. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. so it's a, I think it's a really good story. Um, yeah. I, and there's, and there's some caveats in there. Cause it's, I mean that like any story, you know, everything sounds like, you know, they were overnight success. And even to this day, after doing spots for Amazon, there are still slow months, mm -hmm. you know, there are still yeah. clients that will come to us and want to do something for cheap or, you know, something sure. even for free or just like, and sometimes we have to take gigs like that, you know, it's not, I don't want to make it sound like, oh, we had that gig and now everything is just, you know, rainbows and sunshine, you know, sometimes it's hard and sometimes you'll do, you know, a dozen spec uh, projects and maybe one of them will get picked up. Maybe one of them will get some interest, but a lot of times you're doing all these spec things or free things or passion projects and you're not really getting a lot of traction. And so I, I definitely don't want to mislead people and make it sound like, oh, we did one spec project and it led to Amazon. Yeah. Like technically that did happen, but before that we were doing all sorts of passion projects and all sorts of free things. So a lot of it, a lot of it is just putting in work and be creating and doing stuff and finding your voice, finding your skill, things like that. So, and even leading up to that Amazon gig, like that took, that was over the course of mm -hmm. a few years, yeah. you know, like it didn't happen. Like we didn't do that one job for that company. And then like two months later, Amazon contacted them. Like we did work for that company for probably like three or four years. And then, Amazon contacted them and then another like that's when we did our first video and then like a year went by and then Amazon contacted us again and that's when it kind of started it took yeah a minute, you know it, and in that time it sounds like you were really building your foundation of of contacts you know because mm -hmm. it's in this business it's all who you know mm -hmm. but that can be really mm -hmm. intimidating to a lot of people that don't feel like they know people in the industry yeah. but like I mean you guys have proven like you know you went through a friend first and then they yeah. connected you to this company and then you got connected to this company and you know like you can build your own who you know network <laughs> you know it takes time it takes yeah. work it takes dedication mm -hmm. it takes mm -hmm. spec at commercials that you know putting your own money into yeah. it and everything mm -hmm. but you can get there and you guys are yeah. proof of that yeah and even Oh, sorry, I was just going to say an interesting thing to that point is um, you never really know where a contact is going to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years. Like um, one of our biggest gigs that we've ever done is from a, a person that I met in high school. At, I'm going to age myself here 20, more than 20 years ago, you know, and we didn't do a project for him until, you know, 18, 19 years out of high school. And I've kept in loose contact with him. But, you know, you just never know where these networks are going to go. And mm -hmm. so it's one of those things. It's like you can't yeah. just like the, the commercial contest that we talked about earlier. It's yeah. like we sought out these people who are already successful because we wanted to meet them. 
But a lot of times it's not just trying to befriend successful people. You know, sometimes it's just befriending the people that you get along with and staying in contact with these people because you have no idea where they might lead to, whether they become business owners or whether they become producers for a, a production house or whatever. It's like you just... You never know where your contacts are going to take you. And so it's just a matter of just being kind to everyone, trying to be people's mm -hmm. friends and yeah. being great to work with. So, yeah. And that commercial contest, even though like when we submitted to it, like we worked hard to get into it. We submitted 30 <laughs> different commercials <sighs> to a one commercial contest. <laughs> and we submitted like so many that like the next year they put a limit on how many people could submit, <laughs> how many commercials someone yeah. could submit. And then the next year, we just submitted it under fake names. <laughs> so we still submitted the same amount of commercials, but just under fake Love names. It. <laughs> so it was a lot of work to like even just get accepted and like even get in front of those judges because we – 30 different commercials for one. That's yeah. a lot of work. Contest. That's a yeah. lot. Well, and, and then even funnier, the next year – so like after, what, three, four years of submitting to that contest, they decided just to make us judges so we would stop submitting <laughs> commercials. <laughs> Like we've had enough of these guys, <laughs> but we know they know what they're talking about. So but that just speaks to your drive and how goal oriented you are. Yeah. Again, just like I could tell that in the way we communicated, <laughs> but even in the story, it's like, you wanted to meet this person, you made it happen. And this is how it's not like, oh, just being great. <laughs> like <laughs> it's, it's that drive and that work. And so that's what we love to break down on this show because yeah, it does sometimes feel like, oh, that person had an overnight success. And like, yeah. it's, it's, I mean, 10 years can go by like that y'all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it, it will, it will, if you keep working and doing the good work and that's, mm -hmm. that's a great actually time frame to still build your skills and don't yeah. be hard on yourselves if you don't feel like you're at the, you know, top where you think the top is yet. That's actually like the next chapter of your life. And it's a beautiful <laughs> discovery. Well, it's also For a reminder sure. that like a career in the arts is one of the most frustrating fields you can go yeah. into because it is a field where you are going to be creating and selling like your babies for nothing mm -hmm. you know for a long time before you become successful and it is so much more hustle than you know middle management at a <laughs> even a startup company where it's like you know oh it's uncertain like it's just it's such a difficult field to go into but it mm -hmm. can be so rewarding if you just keep it up yeah. and keep that hustle going you know and a lot of times it really just does take time as long as you're mm -hmm. working hard you know it can take 20 years but then you could end up being you know fucking a-list actor or whatever right. like you know you never know yeah. so yeah it's just it, it takes a lot of work and a lot of time and that's mm -hmm. that's a good reminder i think for everyone yeah. in the field or even just listeners yeah. that aren't in the field that are like well you guys said you're gonna make that movie when's that gonna come out like <laughs> it takes time it all takes time i'm just like tune into the podcast mm -hmm. you'll yeah. see all the nuances that go behind it mm -hmm. and that's why we have the show just to break it down and like for sure yeah well yeah. And, and what's interesting is like, uh, so speaking of projects that take maybe even years, like, again, like I want to emphasize, like, just because we've done work for Amazon doesn't mean like, oh, well, our futures are guaranteed, right. you know, it's like, yeah. there is still struggle. And even like I mentioned, you know, we, we do feature films, you know, uh, on top of doing commercial work, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like right now we have a script that we're trying to find funding for. And that's a story that basically every filmmaker is going through at any given minute, you know? Yep. We're going through it right now. <laughs> yeah. That's where we're at, so, babies. Yeah. yeah. And so like, it's one of those things. Things where it's like, yeah, we have a, you know, a script that we love and, you know, we've had it for a couple of years and it's, you know, we're two, three years into this thing and still trying to get it off the ground. And that, that still happens, you know, and, okay, and yeah. even like, even some of the, the filmmakers here locally that I'm going to say are the big filmmakers here in town, mm -hmm. like they still have to go through a big process to get films greenlit. You know, it's like, yeah. I don't think I, I mean, I'm sure there are some exceptions, but in my opinion, I don't think that you just cross a threshold and then your future is guaranteed. You know, there's always going to be a struggle. There's always going to be like you wanting to get your passion project done and trying to get funding for it, trying to get other people to believe in it. There's just not a threshold you cross where it's like, okay, I'm, I'm set for the rest of my life. You know, at least not, at least not in our experience. Yeah. Well, that reminds me of, and this is very actor specific, but same idea. Um, 
I can't remember the actor's name, but he played Aladdin in the like live action Aladdin. And it was like the biggest party ever had. He was so excited for it. And it like, it put his name out there. Like people knew who he was. And then he couldn't get work after that because mm -hmm. he had that one role. So everybody expected him to be, you know, on that level and have that kind of stuff on his resume. And he had one. So people didn't want to hire him. And it's just like, it goes to show, like you said, it's like, once you, you know, cross that threshold, it doesn't mean you're not ever taking steps back. It doesn't mean anything is guaranteed. Mm -hmm. But yeah. on the positive yeah. note of that, I think it, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the biggest value to you is the confidence of knowing mm -hmm. like you can work with the big players and you have what it takes. And that can continue to be like, I always feel like accomplishing something like that just always boosts your your confidence and your ability so when you are feeling like shit because you can't get like funding or something it's like no but i've i've done amazing work and i shouldn't like diminish that value yeah and it's just the the freaking industry <laughs> and i just <laughs> keep going um so uh, an interesting question to pose is like is there something that you wish you would have like known when you started your career um, to what you know today that you could like give advice to filmmakers or creators? I think one of the biggest things like me personally, I wish I would have known when we first started is that like having the fanciest like gear mm. or like the most expensive gear isn't really a necessary thing. Like it's a little different for like how me, when me and Burke grew up, like when we started doing mm -hmm. filmmaking, because you kind of had to buy like a decent camera from like Best Buy or like whatever to shoot something. Cause we didn't, smartphones weren't a yeah. thing back then. But like nowadays, like if you have an iPhone or like a, just a good smartphone, you can go and make a movie. You can go and shoot a commercial. Mm -hmm. Like, like how, like tools how, can we, can we actually like talk about that right there? Like, because Tessa and I, we talk about, um, so selfishly, selfish question, um, but should be valuable, <laughs> that, <laughs> you know, we could, we talk about this too, for our production company, we are just really trying to do our own shit and our own narratives and like, but we could do commercial stuff. And the one thing I think that stops us is that we don't have a Burke <laughs> who's like so tech savvy and like knows all the, the gear and stuff. So is like using your iPhone like, I just feel like it's not as adequate for, like, a professional shoot. Like, I feel like I, I we had a, a shout out to Tech Nikki Sun, um, who told us about, like, the Lumix cam and, like, mm. how you can still, like, find cheaper cameras that do amazing work. But I guess I just want to know, like, is an iPhone, like, I, I'm sure it varies per client, but would mm -hmm. an iPhone quality really hold for, like, commercial work is what I'm wondering. So, um. Oh, um, I, I was just going to say, uh, a lot of times uh, we'll be shooting, and this it really only happens when we're doing um, commercial work that is kind of documentary based. Um, but there are times when, and taking a test of this, like we'll be filming something, and if the camera in my hand has, I don't know, like a 50 millimeter lens on it, and I'll want like a 16 millimeter, but maybe it's too run and gun, and there's no time to go get something because a great moment is happening in front of me, I'll pull out my iPhone and just put it on the wide lens and film it with that. And so, and mm. we intercut that with the footage. Um, the client never notices, uh, you know, goes live and no one ever notices. So I do think um, for sure with what we do, supplementing um, a, a pro camera with an iPhone is definitely doable and passable. Mm. Um, when it comes to, if we were to shoot an entire commercial on say a smartphone, it's a harder sell. While I think the quality, if it's lit correctly um, and it's bright enough yeah. um, and there's professional audio, I feel like you could get by from a technology standpoint. Mm -hmm. The hardest thing is to overcome um, what, and you kind of reference this, like, is it professional enough? Because a lot of times the client does want to see a big camera. Yeah. Um, and speaking of that, like, or speaking of Amazon, like there was one shoot we did for them where we were shooting on, uh, it was the a Red Dragon um, as the main camera. But then we had, and this was a while ago, so it was the, the Canon 5D, which is mm -hmm. just a little DSLR. Um, that was kind of our B camera. And at one point, one of the Amazon people pulled this aside and like, hey, uh, I saw you shooting on a small camera. Uh, there's going to be execs here tomorrow. Could you shoot on the bigger <laughs> camera? And that was literally the words that they used. was yeah. like, not shoot on like yeah. the Red camera. It was just like, we want to see something bigger. Mm -hmm. So so to your point, yeah, it 
while while an iPhone or any like modern smartphone does have really great quality, getting the client to look past the size of the device is a challenge. And so That's so funny. But you're not the first person to tell me that too. And it's just like <laughs> it's just wild. Cause yeah, but to go back to to what you were saying, Taylor, and I want you to continue, sorry for like interjecting, no, because no, like totally that is what we hear too. But I'm like, I it can't always be that simple there are like things like maybe if you know like like the client's not going to be seated like watching you Mm -hmm. and like in your work and stuff maybe you can get away and with just shooting on your iphone and and i I think to start to you're probably not going to land those clients right Right. it depends on the clients too yeah Yeah. if it's a small independent business that they just need some kind of really good footage they're not going to care you know so yeah i mean it all depends on the situation of course yeah it's all just like if you want to, if you're like getting started, like when we were starting, like it had been perfect. Like you have your iPhone, you shoot a commercial with that, get paid, and then you use that money, invest it back into yourself to buy that little bit more expensive camera maybe you couldn't afford before yeah. or, or something like that. And then mm. you kind of just like keep doing that and reinvesting <laughs> back mm-hmm. in yourself. Like that's like how we, we own currently right now two mm. reds. Oh, she? And that's, <laughs> that's kind of how we've done it. Like we've done one project, invested our money back into our company to buy like all this gear because sometimes renting gear is never the easiest or when you rent a piece of gear it doesn't work all the time Mm. properly and so like it's nice to just reinvest back into your company and buy yourself the nice gear that you wish you had when you first were starting yeah and and speaking of like uh like we were saying a big a physically big camera um yeah because like we shoot on reds but we also shoot on you know a7s threes you know which isn't necessarily a cheap camera but when compared to other like bigger cinema cameras, they are quite a bit cheaper than say a red or an airy. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of times, and we've done this before with clients that like to see a big camera, sometimes we'll just kit out the camera, you know, we'll put like a big map box. I was on just going to say, you build that out. You build that <laughs> yeah, camera so, out. And so while, while the sensor, the, the body is just a teeny little mirrorless body, you know, mm-hmm. you put it on rails, you put a map box, you get an external screen, you, you know, put a big V mount battery on there. And like, you put like an audio module, like all this stuff to make it look big. Hacks, guys. Hacks. This is gold. Yeah. <laughs> so often the client doesn't even notice it, you know? Yeah. And like even lately, we've been polling a lot of our clients just like, oh, do you prefer if things are shot on a red or if, do you care if it's like a cinema camera? Like what is your thought process? And I do think that there are clients that are always going to want that. But I think a lot of times people are becoming, uh, realizing more and more that basically all modern cameras are great cameras, you know, like like something we do a lot is we put our little $3,000 a seven up against our, our red camera. And again, depending on the scenario, making sure everything is exposed correctly and lit correctly, you can't tell which one is better or worse. As far as quality, you might be able to tell a difference between the two, but you're not going to just look at the a seven like, Oh, well that is that camera's a 10th of the price as the red, you know, like it's just, I don't think people are going to realize that. And so the biggest hurdle honestly is just, yeah, like we've talked about, making the camera look big to impress clients is, is a thing. So Yeah, I feel yeah. like if the client is just saying use the bigger camera, they probably really don't know anything about cameras. <laughs> and I mean, honestly, that's why they hire you. Sure. You know, if they knew about cameras, mm-hmm. they could do it themselves. But yeah. yeah. It is interesting because you will get clients that are like, uh, they will request certain pieces of gear. And every time I just roll my eyes, I'm like, you don't even know why you're asking for that. You heard someone talk about anamorphic lenses. So it's like, oh, I, I want anamorphic on this commercial. It's like, Okay. Do you though? Do you know what that means? (laughs) Right. Right. So yeah, a lot of times, yeah, a lot of, a lot of client work is just dealing with basically they've heard buzzwords and buzz phrases that they Mm -hmm. just, they want on their production. So it's like, cool. Yep. We can, we can unnecessarily shoot on those lenses. (laughs) Yep, It's going to cost you an extra X amount of dollars, but sure we can do that. Exactly. Exactly. I just feel like it's almost for their own like ego or, or Mm -hmm. thought of what is, professional that the budget Mm -hmm. needs to cost this much so Mm -hmm. if it's not this much like how is this possible how is this good quality work Mm -hmm. it's not costing like thousands of dollars while we're independent artists and we know how to do things we get scrappy and we know how to make Mm -hmm. shit look amazing for a budget (laughs) so it's just funny how the commercial world differs Mm -hmm. from like the independent world because i think a lot of the costs just kind of go out the window for for certain things The amount of songs and sound effects on Jambox is insane. 
I can't believe these are almost all exclusive to their database. Plus, you can use the stems to make your own. So many resources. Uh, it's wild and affordable. For the kind of indie films we make, we're probably only ever going to pay between $9.99 and $19.99 a month. That's cheaper than a lot of music we've licensed in the past. And the composers that created this music work for huge studios and creators. We're talking directors like Scorsese and global brands like DJI. That's huge. <laughs> yep, that's how you know they're good. And because they love creators, they gave us a discount code to share with our fam. 10% off with code FEM10. Aw, how sweet. We love working with companies like Jambox that actually care and know what creators need. Connecting filmmakers with ridiculously good music and sound effects. So check out jambox.io and remember to use our code FEM10. That's F-E-M-M-E 10. Tessa and I are really excited to have Celtics as a sponsor for the FemRegard podcast this season because fam, we've been using them for years and love their services. Their all-in-one script writing and video production planning tools are used by media creators around the world, and there are lots of reasons to love it. Celtic Studio is cloud-based, meaning your project files are centralized, automatically backed up, accessible from anywhere on any device, and are completely secure. From scripts to reports, all documents follow industry standards, so you can trust your work is production ready. All tools in the Celtic Studio are interconnected to create a faster and easier to manage pre-production workflow. And Celtics is built for collaboration with real-time collaborative script editing, secure sharing links, revision tracking, and comments features. Head to Celtics.com, that's C-E-L-T-X dot com, to create your free two-project Celtics account. When you sign up, you'll get unlimited access to Celtics's full suite of tools for your first seven days. Celtics, the all-in-one solution for script writing and video production planning. I, I did want to say this. One thing you said reminded me of this. Um, so that that ad campaign that we did that led to the Amazon um, mm -hmm. spots, um, like I said, it was a, a worldwide campaign um, over a number of years that we worked on it. And so many of those spots we shot, um, it was on a, a Canon Rebel T2i which is a lot of years old, but it was a $600 camera. Oh, wow. And that's the camera we were shooting. You know, we were, it was, you know, they were sinking millions of dollars into this ad campaign. Yeah. And we were just one of many teams that were shooting these documentary type style of videos. Um, but again, it was a $600 camera that we were shooting on a part of a multi-million dollar worldwide campaign. So yeah. there is something to be said, but again, like being a documentary, you can get away with having a more a smaller camera because they're not expecting like a, a big cinema camera and a big crew to come out and shoot these little documentaries. Right. But again, we were shooting with probably in tops a thousand dollars worth of gear. And this company was flying us all over the world to document different things and shoot different things. And we're just That's like, awesome. okay. Just holding her tiny little mirrorless camera <laughs> just with the, the, the stock kit lens. And so, yeah, like it, it's just surprising. It still is surprising to me how far we were able to stretch that little camera before we were able to earn enough money to actually buy gear that is more professional. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think we used the, the Canon T2i for at least four years yeah. or so, like on that campaign. Like we used that and we had like one of those little nifty 50 <laughs> lenses that cost like 50 bucks. Oh, wow. Because lenses too, like and, that's the next big mm -hmm. cost. They're another thousand yeah. from the ones mm -hmm. I look at. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so we just use like the cheapest lenses, one of the cheap, more cheap cameras. And really it just came down to the fact that like we knew how to use that camera, like the best, like to its best mm -hmm. of its ability, you know, like we put a lot of stock on skill more like than your camera gear type of thing. Like if you... It's more important for you to like learn how to use a camera than it is just to buy the most expensive camera. Because if you don't know how to use that camera, you're not going to get good yeah, footage, exactly. you know? That is a so. key. That is very key. Yeah. You just one, said. one thing that uh, I always tell people and we always tell people is, and this is something that we, we took a lot of years to learn, um, is really the ability to tell a story. Mm -hmm. And in our opinion, in my opinion, is more important than the camera that you use or the lenses, if you know how to tell a good story, it doesn't really matter how it looks as long as you're telling a compelling story. And so that's something that we did um, 
we made sure to that we understood what a good story is and how to tell a good story because that's the most important part. Yeah, I think that's that's yeah, very that's... important to just really like highlight to any listeners is like, you know, you can have the most expensive equipment, you can be working with the most professional people, whatever, but like mm -hmm. it's in the end, the product that, or I shouldn't say the product, the project that you're creating, like the, the story itself has got to be good. Like the content has got to be good. That's what matters the most. And you're only going to get there by knowing how to work that expensive camera and knowing how to tell that story. So yeah, just want to really like highlight that. Yeah. yeah. Even to build on that point, like the reason we kind of feel like it took us a while to kind of like get our groove into finding like clients and getting more clients is like, it is because it took us a while to like find our groove within writing stories and creating mm -hmm. stories. Like we didn't really know how to do that at the first. Like we kind of just put up a camera and just shot something we thought was cool and it didn't really have that great of a story mm -hmm. to it. And so it took forever to, for us to be like, oh, story is actually the most important thing here. And like, let's craft that. And then everything else will kind of fall into place as we're doing that. Yeah. Do you guys have some kind of like do's and don'ts for uh, people trying to find clients? I think uh, we've kind of talked about probably our biggest ones, but I would say like um, a good way, an easy way that we found to find clients and I'll just reiterate, reiterate what we've said before is a lot of times it's asking your network mm -hmm. for work. I think a lot of people think that um, just by knowing a producer or a director or a business owner or whatever avenue it is, I, I think a lot of people think, at least we thought that just knowing these people, they would ask us when they wanted for work, mm -hmm. when they wanted us to do work for them. But so often it's like, hey, will you will you give us a chance doing this? Um, and a lot of times it's actually kind of shocking how often they'll say yes, or at the very least, maybe they won't let you spearhead the project or direct the project, but maybe they'll let you be a B camera on it or something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then to that point, a method that we've talked about is to offer a discounted rate or maybe a free rate. And I want to be clear with that because I think a lot of times, especially in our industry, people are trying to get things for cheap or for free. And I definitely don't like saying, oh, well, we need to be okay doing cheap work and free work as right. filmmakers and as creators, because I think that is also really damaging to an individual. I think it's damaging to the in industry to promise all this free work. So Preach. when when... When we say when we say uh, maybe do a discounted or a free video for a company, do that once for a company. Mm -hmm. Don't do the second and third videos discounted and free because if if they're wanting you to do a second and third video, that means they like what they did, what well, yeah. what you did, and so now they need to be paying for it. So I just want to make it clear there, like we're not in any way saying uh, undervalue yourself. Um, maybe that's what it takes to get in the door, and that's definitely worked for us a couple of times. Um, yeah. But yeah, so as far as our do's and our don'ts, like I would say, yeah, ask ask your network for work. Do maybe do a discounted or a free gig. But then the don't would be don't continue to do discounted or free work because mm -hmm. we all need to pay our bills. We all need to eat. And I, you know, you, you two can attest to this as well. But like there's too many people that just want free work after free work. And it's just it's not sustainable. And I don't like to to, you know, support that mentality either. So, anyway. yeah. And it's just not fun. No. <laughs> um, and a couple of things that like a couple extra do's on top of that is like, we always pride ourselves on being great to work mm -hmm. with. Like whenever we have a set, our crew always comes up to us afterwards and just says, it was so great being on oh. your set. I've never been on a set this fun or like this easygoing mm -hmm. or anything like that. Like we always try to make like try to make our sets fun and light. So, and our client likes to work with us. Our crew likes mm -hmm. to work with us. And then like on top of that, we make great content. Mm -hmm. So it's like, be great to work with and then make sure you're making good stuff. Yeah. Like if you do that, everyone is going to continue to want to come back to you and be like, yeah, I want to work with you again mm -hmm. because you were fun. It was a fun set. Like I, my, like if the client, the client got their concerns answered and then like they, Got a good video in the end and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, we recently uh, worked on a feature film. Um, we weren't running it. We were just uh, doing some of the promo work for it. And the the assistant director on that film was one of those yellers, like one of those screaming uh, ads, which are just it's just a hard set to be on. And and um, since then, you know, working with our own crews, um, we've talked to people who heard just through the grapevine about that production and how the ad was a screamer. 
And it's just like, yeah, that is not a, repu a reputation that you want. Right. And you two can also attest to this one because I've heard you talk about this on your podcast, but I'm sure in LA and for sure in Utah, it's a small industry, you know, it's yeah. a small world here. Mm -hmm. And so word spreads fast. And so if you're terrible to work with, um, you know, no one's ever going to want to work with you again, regardless of how much you're paying them yeah, uh, or how much you're getting paid. And so, um, yeah, it's just one of those things. And I know I listened to that podcast of, uh, it was, uh, the when to, when to talk, when to walk mm -hmm. podcast. Oh I yeah. I've, I had a feeling, <laughs> like, <laughs> but that is something that like, yeah, yeah, like if, if you have a, if, if you run a bad production and people don't like working with you, or if you, they, if you don't pay people, people aren't going to work with you again. And it, yeah. it's just like, it's crazy how fast that word spreads. And, yeah. and on the flip side to what y'all are saying, how fast you are willing to like do so much work for a set for a producer that is, has been amazing to work mm -hmm. with. Mm -hmm. And cause you just know, I'm like, okay, like still going to be a, you know, the shit show of production that it, it always is. Cause it's always a lot of work. It's a lot of, you know, time mm -hmm. and stress but it's like so much easier and more enjoyable when you know like what the mm -hmm. set's gonna be like mm -hmm. you're like sure. we're gonna do all the prep and it's just gonna be you know the normal production hurdles which shouldn't mm -hmm. usually aren't bad when you know people are put together yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah, like cause, yeah because like cause so often and this is true for both uh like feature uh sets and commercial sets so often it feels like you're like essentially war, like at war with people, not war with people, but yeah. you're with people yeah. fighting this big battle, you know? And so, yeah. cause you're doing, depending on the project, you might be doing 12 hour days. You might be doing 18 hour days. Like some of our Amazon projects, um, we used to keep like in the, the production office that we would rent in Seattle, I'm um, on the whiteboard. We would write the number of hours we worked the previous day. Mm -hmm. And it was always like 20 hours we worked that previous day. And like this day, it's like a 19 hour day and it's just, it's miserable. Yeah. But mm -hmm. if you're working with people that you enjoy working with, it makes those really long, hard days bearable. And that's, that's true for any set that we've ever, ever been on. And so it's like film sets are stressful there. You're hitting deadlines, you're missing deadlines. There's a ton of deadlines. And if you don't work with people that you enjoy working with, then the whole experience is terrible. But yeah. if you enjoy working with people, then it's fun because you're in the trenches together getting through this really hard thing. Yeah, exactly. I love that the go to war analogy because that's that's what it is. But you guys like you collectively know that and agree to that. And then when you like that person, yeah, it's it's actually mm -hmm. like, yeah, we're doing this. We're making this <laughs> film or, you know, this this mm -hmm. commercial. Exactly. Yeah, there's a there's an interesting thing. And I'm sure all of us here can attest to this. But um, just the idea because you can get to know someone so well after 10 days with that person on a film set or even even if it's just like a two day shoot, yeah. you like you get through years of friendship in those couple of so days. So true. Because you're just doing something so difficult together and you're learning how to to overcome challenges and, and things together. And so it's just, it's really interesting that at the end of this, you do feel like you're old pals, even though you might only have known the person for a week. So that's something oh, yeah. I really love about film sets. And if not done right, it can be great and it can also be terrible. Yeah. So, yeah. It's so funny because like, besides film, like my day job has been in food service for like over 10 years. And it's the same way in food service. It's like, you are a fucking family with your restaurant coworkers <laughs> because you're all going through it together and you're all miserable, but y'all love each other, you know? And it's like, it's just not like that in a lot of other industries, you know, like my mm -hmm. friends that do retail, like, sure, you will have those people that it's like, I could not get through this day without you. But like, mm -hmm. it's not the same. It's not that like, you are, you become so close so quickly because you're going through it together. So it's just, it's, it's interesting. The yeah. Blood, sweat and tears. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. And, he, and even like another thing, like going back to like, just in general, being great to mm -hmm. work with, like that helps you so much on sets. Cause like sometimes like, like we're talking about crap happens when you're on a set, like things will like go wrong. Like, and when you roll with those punches and it's a fun, like easygoing set, it's a little bit easier to get through those hard patches, Absolutely, you know, yeah. like what well, it was like a few months ago or I don't know, like we were shooting this like high profile client hmm. and we were getting like an interview of them. And when you shoot like a high profile client and they're like reading a script, you get like two takes like max and then that person's done. It's not like an actor where it's like you can get like a few takes in a row and have them do a few like different renditions mm -hmm. of it and they'll be good. 
with high profile clients, like it's just two done, they're out the door. That's mm-hmm. it. And like we had that happen in like the audio, like our backup audio and our main audio just like crapped out for yeah, some reason. Sure. Like our our audio cable, like there was something wrong with it. It didn't and it didn't show up until we were like checking the footage afterwards. And we're like, oh no, we gotta bring him back. Yeah. <laughs> and he was like out the door in his car about to drive away. And we had to tell the client, like, hey guys we need to have them come back up and shoot it one more time. And like, it was awkward. It was weird. We didn't like it, but like, and because we've been so easy going and so great to work with, like that client instantly like forgave us like, Oh yeah, it's fine. It's one time. Like you're Aww. good. Brought him back up, shot it. It was actually the best take he did <laughs> and it worked out and it worked. And like, if we would have been terrible to work with or hard to work with, we would never have that client yeah. again. You know, that is well, so huge. Because yeah. mistakes happen, and like if you've just been so on top of it the entire time, it's like an easy forgiven. Like, okay, mm-hmm. like you know, that's that's really cool. Well, and yeah, and it gave that client just something to joke around with us about every gig since then. It's like, okay, are we getting audio this time? It's like, yes, we're getting audio. <laughs> <laughs> totally, <laughs> that's so true. Um, do you guys, uh, look for commercial work ever in LA or find clients here? Um, well, what's interesting um, is so many of our clients, we travel so much yeah. for or with anyway. So um, most of our work is not actually done here locally. Mm-hmm. Um, so occasionally we'll shoot stuff in LA. Um, <clears throat> we shot a commercial there. I think the last one we shot there was in middle of 2020, which was just an interesting experience I'm for sure. everyone that entire year. So. Yeah. I think that was our first traveling gig um, since the pandemic. And we filmed it in that stage that they uh, uh, was the the bat cave in the Christian bell. The one where it's like the light ceiling. I know that. Yeah, that studio. Very iconic. Yeah. 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 We we film in L.A. occasionally. Um, Yeah. Sometimes it's not it doesn't happen as often as I would like. But, you know. We do Something like comes up, call me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. No, good but to it's, know. It's good for our listeners, too, to know that you can do what you're doing. Uh, I don't want to say remotely because you have to travel to film, but, like, you can be located anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the greatest things about, like, just doing this, like, commercial work. Like, you don't need to be in L.A. or New York. Like, that does help, right. like, when you can move there, like, when it's, like, feasible. But, like, you can be from a small town in Utah and – go to Seattle and do gigs for Amazon Mm -hmm. or travel to Germany to film an interview of some brain surgeon or something, you know, like we've traveled all over the world, like doing our career. And we're just from like a tiny little town. in Utah. No one even knows where it is. And so (laughs) it's like, you can do it wherever you are. You don't need to be in LA. And that's really fun. But to that, to that point though, I imagine um, being in LA, you have a, cause like here in Utah, we have good crews here, but I, I can't imagine we have the same number of potential crews that you might have in LA or New York. Um, so there's part of me that like our Rolodex locally is, isn't as long as I would like it to be just Mm -hmm. because, you know, so often, you know, we'll run through the dozen people that we know for a specific role, but they're all tied up in other projects. Whereas I would imagine the bigger markets have more, have a bigger pool to choose from, which might make it nicer for that reason. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's um that is like a bonus of being out here for sure. Just you do have like more resources and people you can yeah. hire last minute if something happens for yeah. sure. Boy, that last it's minute. It's definitely thing. a bonus and sometimes yeah. a crutch. Like it's kind of hard because there's so many other people that can do that same job. Oh, yeah. So it's like it's a bonus, but it's also very oh. So I wanna I wanna speak to something you just said, like the whole the whole idea of like a last minute production. Like uh in, in all of our like feature film work, I know you speak to this a lot, um, but just a lot of times the productions can be last minute. And I'm telling you that is so much worse in the commercial world. Oh like, my God. Yeah. Like I can't tell you how many times a client has reached out to us and it's like a Thursday and they're like, Hey, uh, we have this idea for a commercial. Can we have it finished by Tuesday? We're just like, ah, uh, well, <laughs> yes, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. Yeah. Cause then it's just like, you're yeah. having to just you know, talk people into working all weekend and like, it's yeah. like, we'll double your rate. And like, we're just, we yeah. need to get this thing done. Or, or like, that's a big thing that Amazon is, is like, they'll, uh, 
they'll they'll call us and it's like, hey, we, this is the idea, and we have two weeks to till we go live. And it's just like, what? Two weeks? Like this is like a half a million dollar commercial. Like how are we <laughs> supposed to put this together in two weeks? Yeah. And so then it's just like sometimes that's happened, and we immediately get on a plane like that night and fly to Seattle and start like all the pre production on it and like meeting with Amazon and. The yeah. twenty-hour yeah, days. The last yeah, because <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it's yeah. so there's just so many moving parts and like mm-hmm. and like getting the you you just like getting the concept down it can take mm-hmm. twenty hours mm-hmm. and then doing like the production planning that's another twenty hours <laughs> and then the mm-hmm. next twenty hours is like okay how do who are we hiring how are we finding what's where are we <laughs> renting and like mm-hmm. the budget and it's just like all those elements so definitely doubling your budget. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when yeah. someone wants something like that because yeah it's, for sure yeah it's so hard i think even burke one time was like on one of those amazon gigs we were in seattle like editing a project burke got on a plane flew to utah i can't even remember what he was grabbing or what he was doing but he flew to utah came back to his house booked a flight return flight to seattle and flew dr- dr- wow. dr- like just to yeah home. ultimately i was coming home to like work on other projects but then things you know they amazon threw another project at us last minute and so yeah i landed in salt lake You're like cool, cool, had cool. enough time to, <laughs> had enough time to eat dinner and then i flew immediately back to seattle it's like why why did i even go home yeah <laughs> crazy that's so crazy just some wild and that's stuff. just like good for our listeners to know that like mm-hmm. it's especially like you know amazon might not like get the whole production process like they're busy with a million other things so yeah. big clients like that they just don't always like know and you kind of have to learn to roll with it or like yes mm-hmm. ask for a higher budget otherwise no one's gonna do the project <laughs> i mean i just always think it's a bad sign when someone's like well you just need to like make it work because that's your job as the producer which I literally hate Mm -hmm. because I'm like you're you're like literally because I know the amount of work and effort is involved you're like killing people for Mm -hmm. like what's the value like if they're getting paid a lot or like you know a, a really good rate then maybe, you know, they could use that money. It's not, it's fine. You know, it's like mm-hmm. not a lot, you know, they can, they can make do with that. But when you're not compensating people like in that way, it's like just, it just sucks. <laughs> for sure. For yeah. sure. And that, that's something that we believe in wholeheartedly is, is making sure that the crew is taken care of, whether it's financially or just, you know, everyone loves good food and good craft yeah. services. But like we, we try really hard to always pay our, our crew what, they uh what their rate is what they're worth um because i you know we all feel this way but like when when a production approaches you're like hey we can only pay you x amount of dollars and i know it's like one quarter of what you normally pay it's like uh, well then it better be like either a really fun set right. or like a project that i really believe in absolutely but if because if you take out the money element it's got to have something else to make it worth it whereas yeah. A lot of times commercial work, it's like the last minute thing. It's like, okay, so this is what for a, just a tech product launch. Like that doesn't sound that exciting. So then it better pay well if you're expecting like long days and, you know, X, Y, Z. Right. So that's something we feel like we've done pretty well on is just making sure the crew is taken care of um, as best as we can. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, it's everything you said. Like, I think our listeners can agree. Like, it's just you you handle everything very professionally and in a way that makes people want to continue working with you. And on that note, I want to, before we start to wrap up, one more thing I want you guys to touch on is your course, um, Film Creator Pro. Yeah, if you want to share with our audience what that is and how they can get involved. Yeah, so we just like this last year, um, because of, you know, COVID, we had production shut down, like things got a little bit slow. And we decided to take that time. We've always been wanting to do it. Um, we decided to create an online course to help like people who are just starting to get into the mm-hmm. film industry or like who are in it and like trying to find bigger clients. Like our course is designed to help them, you know, start out and land higher mm. paying clients. Cause we knew we, like it was hard for us to get started. You know, it took 10 years to start making like a livable yeah, right. wage. And so we wanted to create like an online place where you can go and take that 10 years and like shorten it down to maybe like a few months or so. Like you know what cameras to get, you know how to use the settings and then you know how to create like craft, a, like everything we've yeah. talked about this, you know how to craft a good story, you know, like how to find clients that it's like through your network and through people, you know, and going out and working really hard. And so we took everything we learned in those 10 years, packed it down to like a course that has like 
70 plus videos, wow. seven hours of content wow. um, to just really help that beginner and intermediate filmmaker take their skills like to the next level. I love that. that it, I mean, if or for our listeners, um, as, as you can tell, like these guys like to give you content, like they will, they will bang out so many videos. So I imagine <laughs> the quality and what you guys are delivering is, is going to be really valuable. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. And we're actually, we're giving out like a free resource, just a little, a quick little thing to help people. Um, if you just go to the URL filmcreatorpro.com slash handbook, um, it's just, we've created like this, you know, this PDF that people can keep on their phone. And the idea is like so often on set, you know, even today we still need, you know, inspiration or like uh, a, a reminder of how to like a good way to light a scene or where to start with lighting a scene or yeah. like, which white balance you're supposed to use or, or just simple things like that. And so we created like a, a 12 page ebook that people can keep on their phone oh, um, to quickly go through some of those really basic um, beginner settings. Um, and we're just offering it for free at that URL that people can go in and enter their email address and they'll get a free copy of it. That's awesome. Fam, log on. Cause I'm going to put that on my <laughs> phone and help us. <laughs> yeah. And one of the big reasons that like I wanted to create that too, is that like, Something for me, like I'm, my brain can never understand. Like when you're shooting, like you're like the f-stop on your lens, where it's like you have a 1.2 f-stop. That means your aperture is really like mm -hmm. wide open on your camera. Like you're letting in a lot of light, and that's always kind of like backwards to mm -hmm. me as a filmmaker. Like I feel like with a small number, you need to have like a really small f-stop, not a really big one. And like it's just stuff like that where my brain just can't comprehend like the technical yeah. side of it because you know works really good at the technical side sometimes i'm not very good at the technical side and so it's like nice to have like, like oh that, shoot what like is it big pink. number little number yeah. like right in the middle of like yeah. the, the set chaos of it all mm -hmm. anyways yeah that's so true yeah. and you you can't go watch a youtube video you can't go out to your online course or ask someone you have it on your phone you just look it up it's right there and you're good to go oh. and that's like, just so simple and so easy to be right there Love that. and it's so filmcreatorpro.com slash handbook correct yep Awesome. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. We're going to plug that for sure. <laughs> that's that's going to be an amazing resource for our listeners. You guys are so great. <laughs> yeah. And for our listeners too, um, to see more of your work, to contact you, to hire you, all of that kind of stuff, anything you want to share, your website, social media, all of that. Um, yeah. To hire like our production company, like you can just go to atomiccity.com. Um, we'll send that to you as well. So you can great. put it in the show notes but like and you can follow us on you know atomic cities on instagram film creator pros on instagram um we mainly just have instagram i i think we have facebook as well but we're with so just three of us it's hard of us to do so many social media <laughs> yeah. outlets so we just kind of i kind of just stick to instagram it's hard enough for me to just do that but yeah, you can go follow us there. No, awesome. The, our our fem fam community will will love that, and um, we hope that you know they they download. They, I mean, you guys have to because I'm telling you to. But <laughs> just, I I just think you guys really today's uh, conversation was so lovely. I think we we got to go into like just really the the details of like what it takes, and especially mm -hmm. with commercial work, we because. Sometimes that, that for most creators, that is a great bread and butter. So that way mm -hmm. you can focus still on your creative while, <laughs> you know, your creative projects like your script, your feature film that takes forever and keeps mm -hmm. you still in production. That's um, yeah. something that I'm like interested in too. So we are. So it's just like a great, great way to mm. like understand that world a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. It is. It has been interesting because um, a lot of people, because the commercial world, can be very different than like the creative filmmaking world. Sure, sure. But there are some things that are really um, similar. Like obviously you're going to learn the technique and from a technical standpoint, much, I think much better in the commercial world because you're forced to do like really professional looking images or lighting mm -hmm. or whatever. And so then that also translates over into feature film work. Yeah, because, why wouldn't you want that on your yes. feature film? <laughs> so you're like, you're hopefully earning money doing commercial work and also working on your skills that you can then take and, tr and turn it into like a feature film or, or a short film or whatever your yeah. passion is. I mean, like just the proposal part too, I think a lot of like, you know, the creatives kind of struggle with, you know, when you're having to go in to pitch a commercial, you're going to have to pitch your film. And so that also getting those, like the marketing side of it done is mm -hmm. just so valuable to learn um, 
if you're you're interested in commercial work, I think that really <laughs> strengthens your the way you are like, yeah, having a proposal made and because you're going to need that. You're going to need mm-hmm. that sign if you're trying to get money <laughs> for your film. Yeah, for sure. And, and for us, it's also been a great way even just to meet crew and even meet crew, hire crew and pay them their rate. And then on the side of that, be like, and we're also working on this passion project that we don't have as much money for. Yeah. You know, and it gives us a, it gives yeah. us more of a, I don't know, like they're our friends and we've paid them well before. So it's like, can you do this it's passion project for us at yeah. a discounted rate? Mm-hmm. And again, I hate asking for that, but at least we try to make it up in other ways, you know? Yeah. So there are ways so that the commercial world has helped our, our narrative, our, our film production world. So I love there's that. pros and cons to both. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you guys so much for coming on yeah. today because this, yeah. I know it really has benefited us <laughs> like as something that we are thinking about um, mm-hmm. doing more of in the future. Um, but I know our listeners too, yeah. you know, there's so many people that want to get involved in this industry in general and people just say, well, go out and make films. And it's like, mm-hmm. okay, but like, wh- what about making money? What about like, you know, all of that? So like this, I think was really, it's going to be helpful for a lot of people listening that just don't know how to get started and don't know what to do. So yeah. Yeah. Well, no, thank, thanks for having us. Like I love talking about, you know, this and this is our passion and I love just talking about filmmaking in general. So thanks for having us. And it's, it's good to also meet other people in the industry and, LA and other places like that's really helpful to us because like it's who you know like we talked about this whole time it's all about networking and finding other people to work with yeah Yeah. and And Utah's not that far from us (laughs) (laughs) well like like our Utah Film Commission says it's only a 90 minute flight from LA there you go (laughs) for whatever reason that is what our state really pushes like we're actually pretty close to LA (laughs) that's That's funny (laughs) no but really if you guys need a resource please for anything Mm. like reach out like we're we're happy to connect that's like we believe in that you know offering whatever it can it can be a connection it can be a conversation we're here for for any of that so for sure um, no, that sounds yeah, good. our doors are open we'll definitely keep in contact yeah, absolutely yes. thanks for listening to fem regard podcast if you like what you hear tune in every friday for more tips on the filmmaking business and insightful conversations with industry professionals We can only grow with your support, so please subscribe, share, rate, and review. You can also join the Fem Fam on Patreon. For more on us, check us out at femregard.com. You're listening to the Geekscape Network. 